Hello and welcome to Module 2 of Every Child Ready to Read for Early Art Childhood Educators. Um, in this module, we're going to take a look at the five best practices of Every Child Ready to Read 2. Um, in the modules, you have some information about the transition that was made between Every Child Ready to Read 1 with the six early literacy skills and Every Child Ready to to read to which offers the five best practices um, and you can see that was done to break things down to make it easier to transfer and translate to parents um, and so these five best practices we're going to talk about relate directly back to those six early literacy skills so make sure that you've looked at those before moving forward so you can make that connection the five best practices of every child ready to read are talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. And these five best practices are things that you should be doing in your daily schedule just naturally. It should be part of your everyday routine. It should be part of what you're already doing. But just looking at it and being intentional about bringing each of these practices in will help you to help children to prepare for reading when they go to kindergarten. So we're gonna take a closer look at each one of these. Um, and we'll just list them briefly what's on your screen here um, but then we're going to break them down as um, individual practices and take a look at some of the things that you can do in your classroom so talking obviously talking with children helps to build that vocabulary and the narrative skills um, and we know that the more words that a child hears spoken um, throughout their naturally occurring day, the um, more successful they'll be in learning language and in applying that to reading later on. So lots and lots of talking is very important to help children to get ready for school. Singing actually helps to slow down the sounds in language so children can start hearing the individual sounds and syllables of words. Reading, obviously, that's what Every Child Ready to Read is all about. Um, but when you're reading, you want to think about modeling how those words are connected to the text on the paper um, and the pictures um, in the books that you read. Writing, obviously, small children don't write letters, um, and it wouldn't be developmentally appropriate for children who are not ready to start trying to write letters. But when we talk about writing here, we're talking about the scribbling and the drawing, um, even of circles that lead to other things. Um, and that leads to later writing of letters. Um, and then playing. Playing is how children learn best. Um, children learn by experimenting and discovery during playing. And so it's the most important thing that you can do um, with a child in connection to talking um, and reading in your classroom. So let's take a look at talking a little bit more in depth. When you talk, um, and for each one of the best practices on our screen, we'll have some early literacy skill focuses. So when I have talking as our practice, that broken down includes listening, speaking, and communicating. So for each of the early literacy skill focus areas, we have that at the top of our slide. Um, when we look at talking, we're, we're thinking about the oral language that's the basis for all later literacy. So when a baby interacts with an adult and they imitate those facial expressions and sounds, um, that leads later on to talking and that communication. And it also leads to bonding, which further grows that language ability. Um, later on, when we look at talking, children start narrate, narrating what's happening. And so when we do this practice um, in our classrooms, we want to make sure that we're narrating what ha what's happening, um, especially for children who don't yet have the words. So when you're changing a diaper, explain, we're going to go change your diaper now. You're dirty. First, let's get the diaper. Um, and just talk through, even if the child can't repeat that back to you, if the child's an infant, you're giving that child interaction and you're giving that child words. Um, and then you want to ask questions. So um, again, even if the child can't answer you, if the child's an infant, if the child's a toddler or the, doesn't have the language yet, you want to ask questions. And that helps a child to understand that language is a way of communicating and that um, builds those skills for later communication and conversation. 
So again, all of those things, the more words that a child hears, the better they'll do with cognitive development, that social emotional interaction, and then later on in, in being successful at school. Talking has to do with hearing the sounds and words, but it also has to do with hearing the rhythm of language. So using that um, lilt in your voice when you ask a question or, um, you know, being really animated when you're reading a book helps a child to understand that there's a certain rhythm that's used with conversation and language. Um, you want to point out new words as much as possible, and that helps children to learn new vocabulary. So as I said before, we're looking at these best practices, and you can see how they relate back to those six early literacy skills. So when we're talking about talking, we've already touched on narrative skills and vocabulary. Um, and then again, I've mentioned already several times, practicing conversation skills. So that give and take, that I talk, then you talk, then I talk, and that it is a dance, that it's um, a back and forth effort um, between two people. Um, again, looking back at those six early literacy skills we already covered, phonological awareness, obviously, when you're talking, um, you're, you're making sounds, and as children learn more words, then when it's time to sit down and learn how words have meaning and, they make, and letters make sounds, which make words, all of that talking beforehand makes such a big difference to that later understanding of how to read and those first steps of understanding the sounds of words. Um, children who fall behind in oral language and literacy development are much less likely to be successful as readers. So you want to make sure that you're giving them those tools to be successful when they do go to school to start to read. Um, and you don't want to take those early literacy skills, those six skills we talked about before, and only teach them by themselves. So you don't want to, you know, talk about um, print has meaning without also expressing um, you know, explaining the vocabulary and showing children how to, how to have narrative skills because all of those things together work so that children can learn how to read and that comprehension has to do with each of those six early literacy skills. You always want to make sure that you reach out to parents, that you explain to them the importance of talking. Um, there's such a big gap between children who hear words, a lot of words spoken in their home, and children who don't, um, there's a 30 million word gap by the time they reach school. Um, and that tells you, you know, that, that that talking makes a huge impact. So those children who've heard those 30 million words less, when they get to school, they are not ready to learn to read. So it's so important that we convey that same message to parents that we um, work with in our schools and in our centers. Um, so again, there's a 30, that 30 million word gap, um, and it's so important that we help to fill that gap. One way that you can help um, children really start to express the narrative skills, um, wordless picture books are great for that. So when, when you find some picture books, even if they have just a few words on the page, it gives the child the opportunity to be the storyteller and to look at the pictures and make the connection between what's happening and telling a story and those narrative skills. Um, and you want to also give them vocabulary. So as they're working, if you have a wordless picture book, help them understand the meanings of words um, as they're going. They may, may use some words a little bit incorrectly as they're telling a wordless picture book story. Help them by giving them the vocabulary. Um, and then always talk throughout the day. Talk, talk, talk. Ask questions, explain activities, prepare children for transitions. I can't say enough about how important talking is. Um, and then you want to give the children time to sort of review what they did um, throughout the day, maybe at the end of the day. A very high scope idea, if you use high scope in your classroom, is that plan, do, review. So a child gets to plan what they're going to do, they do it, and then at the end of the day you talked about um, what they did, and the child gets to tell you in their own words, which again leads to those narrative skills. So moving straight from talking to singing, um, this graphic that's on here actually came from Kinder Music and I love um, what it shows you. Um, the brain, every single part of the brain is stimulated by musical activities. So you can see on this slide all the different 
parts of the brain that are lit up from vision to balance, hearing, speech, behavior, sensation, skill, movement, and emotion. Each part of the brain um, that's color coordinated with those words um, is stimulated during musical activities. So not only does music and singing slow down the sounds and language, but it stimulates the brain and learning. So when we look at singing and connect it back to the things we've talked about with learning to read, that sounds, rhythm, and language, um, it also helps children to connect words um, to the rhythm of language like we talked about. Um, it hear, helps them hear the sounds. Listening skills, so understanding that um, they have to listen and follow directions. Um, remembering the lyrics to tell a story. A lot of times um, you might find books that are songs or you might be able to sing songs that tell stories. Um, and children help, it helps children to memorize them when they rhyme and they're sing-songing. And then again, singing slows down the sounds and language. You want to pair singing with movements as much as possible because that helps the child to remember the words and remember the order of the song. Um, you can also use sign language, which is very um, helpful for children who have trouble expressing themselves through words. And then props, um, things that flannel board, story pieces, or puppets um, paired with singing help children to remember and be able to redo the song again. You want to repeat some songs every single day. So that's why um, if you have a ritual of a hello song every day and a goodbye song every day, it's important because that is helping a child to learn um, those narrative skills. They're not only greeted with something that's very comforting to them that they know, but it's also helping them to remember and work toward being able to retell a story. Use shakers, instruments, bells, rhythm sticks, anything you can um, that has to do with that music and movement to help them remember it. Um, and then new vocabulary can be introduced through songs, um, and that just helps children to learn words better. Um, another thing that's important to point out is if a child is learning a second language, let's say you have a child whose primary language is Spanish um, and English is their second language, when you start introducing songs um, in English, those are often the first things that a child can learn. Um, when I do this training in person, I always use a little example of um, when I was in high school and sang in a choir, we sang all kinds of different languages. And I'm not sure I could tell you what they meant still because it's been a long time, but one song in particular, um, we sang a German song and I can still remember the lyrics. Um, Im Schlatten des Waldes im Buchen gezweig, der Rex sieg und raschelt und flüstert zugleich. And because that was ingrained in me, I remember those words. So that's just a good example of how powerful singing can be to help children whose, in, whose language, um, their second language is English. Again, when we do Spanish and we teach children some Spanish words, it's often um, paired with singing. So it just shows you how powerful music is with learning language. And reading. Reading is at the heart of every child ready to read, obviously, and it's never too early to read to a child. It's super important that we convey that to parents. Um, even if they only read 15 minutes a day to their baby um, in the womb, when the baby's born, when they're a toddler, when they're a preschooler, it will help them to become successful readers later in life. Um, when a parent is reading, they should point out and name some pictures in the book that helps with that vocabulary and connecting to the, the printed word. Um, and it also shows that print motivation we talked about where we really wanna show children how fun reading is and how to hold a book and be really interested in reading. Um, and we need to understand, all of us, parents, all of us, all of us teachers, um, that two-year-olds and, and below have a short attention span. And so if we don't finish a book, it's okay. The point is that we are trying um, to read with the child and that we're showing them that reading is fun. If you're sitting with a child and you're trying to get 15 minutes of reading in and the child is very unhappy, reading's not going to be much fun to them. So we want to make sure that it's fun, and if that means shorter amount of times, that is still wonderful. When you read with babies and toddlers, I've got five steps for sharing books um, with babies and toddlers here on the screen. These are great to use with parents, so feel free to give these out to parents as well. 
Um, we want to make sure, again, that you're picking the best time of day. So when, when the baby or the toddler is in a good mood, probably not around nap time and probably not around meal time, um, show the baby the book and point to the pictures. Talk and have fun. Um, watch what the baby does and sort of play off of what the baby or the toddler does and kind of mimic back to them what they're doing. That gets them involved in telling the story. And again, read every day. Um, 15 minutes is ideal, but anything less than that, again, is still wonderful. Reading should be a social experience and it should show children um, how to have listening skills, how to, how to be interested in what is written and being told um, from the story. It helps children hear the rhythm of language and recognizing environmental print. So when we talk about environmental print, it's pointing out things in the natural environment that um, have words on them. Before we even do words, just pointing out shapes in the classroom or at home, circles, squares, triangles, because letters are actually made up of all those shapes. So that's really important. Um, when you start pointing out environmental print in the, envir in the environment in your classroom or outside, um, encourage parents to point at signs as they go, the stop sign, the McDonald's sign, the Walmart sign, things that children are familiar with um, because those are often the first thing that children read and that's the first step toward actual reading. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're always pointing out environmental print. In the classroom, as you're reading, make sure you ask questions as you read. A lot of times we get so into really trying to make children sit and listen that we forget how important it is to give the children opportunity to answer questions and to become part of the storytelling. So um, we'll talk a little bit too in some of the other um, information in the modules about dialogic reading, and that is that turn taking and asking questions as you read. It's important to ask children what they think will happen, and it's important to ask them um, what they see in the pictures on the page. You wanna choose large font um, in the books because children will then start recognizing print on the page. You wanna point out the details and illustrations, um, as I said, and ask questions about them. And choose books that you enjoy reading. There will be books that you'll read that children will want to read over and over and over, and that's important because that repetition is super important for children to learn. But choose some books that you enjoy too because that shows children how enjoyable reading is. And always make books available throughout the day. Um, children should be able to handle and hold and learn how to turn pages in books. That is very important. So moving on to writing. Um, on this screen, I love this image, um, and there's a little link there if you wanna look it up. This is the stages of scribbling that leads to later writing. So you notice we move all the way from dots to vertical lines all the way across until we get to making circles and making things that actually represent things um, in, in people in, in a child's life. Um, the little pictures on the side show you that there are some ways that you can get to writing um, before a child's actually writing. So you wanna build hand muscles to get that pincer grasp where um, that grasp that a child needs to hold a pencil or a crayon. Um, I love the whole hand crayons, that little picture on the right, um, where before a child can actually use that kind of grasp, they can use their whole hand, and that's creating stronger muscles in the arm and, and more control in the hand and hand-eye coordination. Um, and those can be used with toddlers. Um, using a spoon, being able to raise a spoon to the child's mouth on, on their own, that's leading again to those um, strong muscles that are needed for writing. And even picking up Cheerios or picking anything up where you have to use that little grasp to be able to pick things up um, strengthens the finger muscles. Um, on this screen, it just says exactly what we were just talking about. You want to strengthen those muscles. You want to strengthen that hand-eye coordination before a child's ever able to write. Um, print awareness and letter knowledge. So those are connected. As you are um, showing a child that letters have meaning and words have meaning, you're showing them this is how we communicate. And so they're going to move toward that as they begin using writing utensils. They're going to understand they can create that same print and that same way of communication. Um, drawing shapes and putting shapes together, um, when you're doing it as modeling or have them start doing it, those all lead to later writing. 
This is just uh, more broken down of those stages of pre-writing. I love the graphic on the right as well. It just goes through and shows you each individual step. Um, again, you can feel free to use this and show it to parents who are concerned that maybe their child isn't writing um, enough, that these are actually the developmental stages and it's developmentally appropriate for them to move through this cycle before being able to write. So if they haven't done any of these things, then they're just not ready yet. And we need to keep working on um, strengthening muscles and hand-eye coordination and that print awareness. Um, things that you can do in the classroom. Always provide plenty of different writing tools. That includes crayons and chalk, outside even, pencils and markers. Um, provide opportunities for tracing. So you can take a highlighter and have, um, you can draw something with it and then have the child trace over top of it with a, with a pencil or a different color crayon. Um, give them opportunities to work on those muscles and work on that hand-eye coordination. And then when they're ready for scissors, it's so important. I can't tell you how many um, different programs I've been where children, when they first come, have never touched a pair of scissors. I think a lot of that has to do um, with fear <laughs> at home of things being cut or that safety idea that, that scissors aren't safe. So it's so important in the classroom that we have safety scissors, that we make that available. The first things they can cut are Play-Doh. Have them cut Play-Doh and practice with plastic safety scissors until they're able to move up and use um, scissors that cut paper and always, always, always instill that that's all, the only things they cut, of course. Um, you can cut, have them cut straws. That's a really good um, thing that gives a little bit of resistance as well as a child's cutting it. So it, it strengthens those muscles. And then um, work with families and explain, you know, how to teach them how to use scissors. So the thumb always goes in the top and the two fingers in the bottom and open and close and open and close. Um, and you can do this as a family um, activity if you have a family night or family literacy night make scissors available too and explain how that's important to early literacy. So wrapping up with our best practices, we did talking, singing, reading, writing. Playing is the most important thing, as you know, as an early childhood educator, that children can do to learn. It's the primary way they learn about the world around them, they discover and experience, um, and it overlaps with every single one of the early literacy skills and the best practices. So um, even though infants and toddlers might not play together with another child, it's important that they learn how to play beside another child and eventually lead toward that playing together. Um, and interacting with adults and toys, those are all important play rituals that infants and toddlers should be doing before they get ready to play with other children. Um, again, you want to work toward all of these things. And again, if you talk with parents, explain the importance of play. If, if you have anyone who questions why the children are playing so much in your classroom and they're not learning, explain to them that it is about experimenting and learning and discovering and trying new things. It's about children learning how to get along with others and take turns and have those conversation skills. It's about learning the boundaries and the expectations you have for them and about waiting sometimes, that self-regulation. Um, I have to wait because it's not my turn. Being able to stay calm while you wait. And play is a child's work. That is how they learn um, everything from early literacy to self-help skills to social and emotional well-being. Play is the foundation for all of it. On this screen, I have just the different types of play. Um, you can print this out and use this. You can refer back to it. Um, as children start progressing, um, once they start playing together, it's usually that dramatic play. They reenact things from their own lives and world that they see. And then maybe some fantasy where they're using objects to represent other things, such as a marker as a rocket. Um, and then that exploratory that they're discovering how things work through experimenting and trying to do different things with the same materials. Um, manipulative play is using fine motor skills, so all of those manip manipulative toy items in your classroom. Physical is that large muscle movement that's so important for a child. That's why outside time is so important from infancy on. Even if you take a baby out on the playground and have a blanket and they're looking at the sky and feeling the wind and you're moving their legs and their hands, 
they're getting so much from that experience. And then eventually children will get to games with rules and they're so, they will start making up their own rules as well. You want to provide dramatic play materials as much as possible. And this is so important to um, really encourage at home. Parents are so busy just trying to get um, from work to home and dinner and bath and bed. But children need that, that experience with their families and their parents and their siblings. They need that attention and that dramatic play and pretend because that's where their safe safest zone is, is at home. And that helps them to have imagination and experience and um, discovery. Um, and then you want to have a, a big amount of your daily schedule as play. And again, explain to parents or um, anyone else who asks why there's so much play, all of those reasons why that we talked about. Use printed text as much as you can during playtime. So if you have labels um, for toys, you can put the pictures of the toys that go there, but also include text. Um, and put things like phone books or newspaper or um, boxes of cereal or um, recipe books, those kinds of things, all throughout the room so that text is represented in all of the different areas. And then give children opportunities to practice sharing and turn taking. Again, play is all about building all of those skills. In our next module, you're going to look at choosing um, picture book that will connect to one of those best practices. Um, and so make sure that you watch the next module presentation and take a look at um, the material and resources that are provided there. And as always, let me know if you have any questions, if I can help you clarify anything um, when choosing your book next week.